Good day, everyone, and welcome to Virtual Galas 2.0, taking virtual galas to the next level in 2021. We're glad that you're here. 2020 has been a long and interesting and challenging year that has provided lots of opportunities for growth. And we appreciate you taking the time to spend this with us and doing a little learning and the opportunity to share some of the knowledge that we have garnered in the last eight months. So let's get started. I am Greg Caroga, the founder of Stellar Fundraising Auctions. I've been a fundraising auction consultant since 2004. I became a virtual gala specialist consultant in March of this year, and since then have conducted over 30 virtual galas, raised over $6.8 million online, which sounds like a lot until you meet our co-presenter, Beth Sandifer of Beth Sandifer Events. Beth is the queen of virtual galas in the Bay Area and beyond. She's done over 45 virtual galas this year in every time zone of the United States, helped raise over $15 million. Beth is also longtime friend and co-presenter at all the educational in-person workshops and webinars that we do. So I think you're going to really enjoy learning from Beth, and I'm always thankful to have her with us. And let's do a little housekeeping. As always, we are going to record this webinar and make it available to all attendees afterwards. We'll send out the link via Zoom tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time. So feel free to take notes. Don't feel pressured to have to do so by all means, but if you want to, great. If you have a question at any point in time, feel free to enter it in the Q&A box. You can see that down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. In fact, uh, we appreciate if people start entering questions during the presentation. We're not going to answer them until we get to the very end, but if there's one thing we've learned in virtual galas this year, it's that it's nice to have a little momentum built before you actually get to the point where you're reacting to stuff. What are we going to cover? Well, let's start with the state of fundraising in 2021. And one of the big questions, and why I'm sure a lot of you are here, virtual galas, do they still work? We'll talk about audience expectations and, and our dream virtual gala or what we think are some absolute best practices for, for implementing a virtual gala. And then we'll talk about best practices for silent auctions, live auctions, and the fund of need. And then we'll talk about auction lots that work best in a virtual gala. And finally, we'll talk about the timeline for planning a virtual gala. If you are a spring event, I hope your ears just perked up. So let's start with the state of fundraising in 2021. 2020 was a challenging year for fundraising, but if there was one consistency, it's that we knew we were not going to be able to get back to being in person. 2021 is going to offer a slightly different kind of challenge. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, but, but right now that light is on the front of a COVID-powered locomotive that is barreling through our country. But once vaccine distribution begins and, and rates start to go down, we're going to see an honest-to-goodness light at the end of the tunnel, which, you know, it's going to be great for us as a society. It's going to be excellent for our collective psyches, but it is going to make it difficult for some events to choose to go virtual when that carrot of being back in the room together is dangling so precariously close. We've learned a lot of lessons in 2020, and one of the biggest is do your event the way you can at the time you can. Chasing the white rabbit of being back in the room is challenging at best and damaging at worst. Just ask every March or April 2020 event that wound up postponing, postponing, and then postponing again to either do their event in what has been the most crowded fall fundraising season of all time, or simply cancel it, or do sub, uh, some suboptimal version of fundraising that didn't yield the results that their organization truly wanted. And look, we get it. We wholeheartedly want to be back in the room with you and your supporters, but we're already seeing a lot of events hedging their virtual bets. So this year, we're encouraging you to give yourself at least a three to four month deadline Give yourself some room before you call the ball, before you give up on being, no, not let me rephrase that. Give yourself some time so that you can make the decision and commit to going virtual and have it be meaningful. And that's at least three to four months. So plan on being virtual through June. If you're a March, April, or May event, in California especially, you're not going to be in person. You might be able to do outdoor in person the summertime, but really, at this point, we're thinking we're not going to be doing big in-person events again until fall at best, maybe 2022, which brings us to the big question. 
And that big question is, do virtual galas still work? And the short answer is that yes, they absolutely do. Virtual galas enable you to do a ton of positive things like getting your crowd to come together. It enables you to tell your the, the message of your organization and your mission. You can celebrate the work that you do or that you have done. And of course, you are raising money now instead of later. But it doesn't mean that they're easy. Um, one of the things that we like to say is that the pandemic has sort of magnified tendencies. So however your crowd behaved before, they're doing that now like sort of to the extreme so if you have a crowd that is there to support you like they come and they're they're all about just like supporting the work that you do your virtual gala is going to do great financially if your event is more the kind of event where your crowd comes to see and be seen and have a great party you're going to have some additional challenges transitioning to a virtual event so on average, we still feel like we're seeing virtual events raise about 90% of what they would have budgeted for in person. Um, live auctions have been holding, holding pretty steady at raising about 85% of their in-person budget all year long. Fund needs or special appeals, you know, earlier in the year, they were coming in at like 120% of the, the in-person goals on average. That's dipped a little bit as the year has gone on to about 110%. Um, but again, this is average. So, you know, there's always outliers. Um, but there are still a lot of questions that people have about virtual galas, even this many months in. Um, will the crowd tune in? Can we get sponsorship? Can we do a live auction? Like, how does that work? Um, seeing a lot more questions about the difference between a one screen experience versus a two screen experience as different bidding platforms have evolved over the year. Um, people are asking like, well, where do we find auction items? We feel like it's changed. And how do we make our virtual gala stand out from the crowd? All great questions, all challenges that the fall season events had to face as well, and they did great. So if you've done a virtual gala before, the biggest thing that you need to know going into 2021 is that you now need to up your game because expectations of the audience have changed. There are a lot more sophisticated expectations now. And if you haven't done a virtual gala, know that you're still going to have higher expectation from your audience because things people have been attending these throughout the year. Um, Greg and I did an event together in September where initially the organization felt like, well, we need to keep this like short and sweet. We just want to get in and get out and we don't want people to have to be, you know, online for a long time. And they had in their minds, like, it's going to be Zoom and that's not what we want. And we did their event, not in Zoom. It was very well produced. We got to the end of their 45 minute program and the reaction we got was like, well, oh my gosh, I didn't know it was going to be like that. It was so engaging. It was so exciting. And like, I wish we'd gone longer. So, you know, know that, that uh, you just, you need to really come at this with a level of sophistication now so that you're meeting your donors where they are in terms of their expectations, which I think is a great segue, uh, Greg, to talk about our dream virtual gala. Why, thank you, Beth. During a recent event wrap meeting, a longtime friend and client asked me, what would your dream virtual gala look like? And, and I thought it was a brilliant question because I hadn't stopped to think about like what if I could design it from the from the virtual ground up, what would it look like? And 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 I have an answer. And and in fact, we both have a lot of thoughts about this. I love this question. It's my thing. Um, so first off, my dream event, there would be a reason to charge people a ticket price. Um, most events have been doing events that are free to attend. Um, but my dream events, like maybe the main part is free to attend, but there's some kind of pre-event or virtual gathering that's a VIP reception or a wine tasting, that, a, a Q and A with a keynote speaker that is a purchase, you know, pay to play experience, or you're doing some kind of food option that's delivered to each attendee before the show. Um, and this can be tiered out. Um, I did an event where there was a VIP ticket price where you got a meal delivered to you. And there was a general admission price where you went to the same restaurant and picked up your meal. Um, I've done, you know, celebrate from home, like party in a box, you know, kinds of things that are shipped out. Like I've shipped things all over the country. Um, and I love that because it still creates kind of a communal experience for you. Um, next thing that would be a part of a dream event for me would be to have your gala produced in a studio. Um, so you can start bringing in things like a digital LED wall, like this is one set uh, at the Lux Productions, which is my partner AV company. Um, digital walls are great. You can completely switch it up. This is also at the Lux, same set, just a completely different look because we were using that video wall. 
And and in studio could be you know a hotel like this event that I uh, did at the Ritz, or you could utilize a green screen like the studio at Verducci, or the green screen room at Got Light, or or any other studio. Our our ideal virtual gala isn't just in a studio though. It utilizes set pieces that add to the virtual element of the production. And, and at best, these are thematically relevant pieces that are used in pre-event marketing, et cetera. So what you see here are obviously meant to be Oscar awards and it's it, the, the event was lights, camera, auction. And obviously we had this big marquee in the middle of the set with the screen behind it so that we could project whatever we wanted onto it. But they took these elements and then used them in pre-recorded elements that were filmed at their location and, and with some of their, their clients, if you will, um, but with your clients or with your supporters. And so this is the Humane Society of Southwest Washington. Their event, lights, camera, auction, uh, they made their virtual gala, this set piece made their virtual gala immediately recognizable to their supporters because we started the event with this video and bear with me because all the time I've spent doing virtual galas this year have been in front of the camera, not running the show. But here's the set pieces on set. You can see we've got, there's, there's our MC Danny and, and um, our event planner and producer. And then here's the video that started the show. So bear with me. school you could have for example kids performing in front of the this whatever the set pieces are you know everybody loves to see their kids um and this is what i was afraid of this is where i'm i'm good at advancing this there we go um take the set pieces to each committee member's house have the event chairs record their welcome remarks in front of them but just make your gala immediately tangible and recognizable to your guests yeah, and what's really, you know, I think the takeaway that we want you to get here is that if you can have your whole virtual gala designed to take maximum advantage of your environment. So if you're in a studio with a video wall, incorporate that video wall, you know, bring in set pieces, have elements that are designed to be seen on screen and interacted with by the presenters. Um, and if you can do something with multiple camera angles, multiple cameras or camera angles, like that is even better. Like we want something that looks more and more like a TV show and and less and less like a web conference. And so doing these kinds of things, having sets, having multiple cameras, that's gonna really play up that sort of that perspective. And another thing that'll play up the perspective of feeling more like a TV show and less like a web conference is to have two presenters on the stage having a conversation with each other. They need to be either comfortable with each other or at least have one person who's extremely comfortable being on screen and guiding a conversation. And they both need to be able to handle some curveballs. So you still need to do some scripting and you're going to need to rehearse it. But having this kind of more natural interaction between people is going to just really um, make your your event feel just more authentic and personable and as an auctioneer i feel compelled to repeat what other people say and so rehearse 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 rehearsal is all about getting your show right but also rehearsals about making your people comfortable and and uh, umberto here and i like he really warmed up through the course of rehearsals and by the time we got to show he was ready to roll now, one of the things that we miss about being virtual is that we can't see your crowd, right? Um, unless you're doing an event in Zoom, and we don't really recommend doing that, so especially not for our dream virtual gala. So 
It's still nice to see some of your crowd though, right? So when it's safe to do so, we'd like to have live feeds from at least two supporters' homes. And this gives us opportunities to do scripted interaction with supporters, emphasis on scripted. These families knew exactly when we would be cutting to them so that they could bring the energy and be excited and be on screen. We didn't ever want to cut to an empty table or a bunch of people who weren't looking at the screen, right? Uh, they had to participate in rehearsals. They had to make sure that their tech and everything worked out, but it really helped bring the virtual gala. It made it feel like, yes, this is a community, not just a guy in front of pipe and drape talking, right? Now, our ideal, and oh, and one other thing about this was we had some of the donors of the auction lots at these, at these various houses. So when we got to the point in time to talk about those auction lots, we brought the donor to the camera and were able to cut to them, just like we would try to bring them up on stage during the auction. What is our ideal virtual gala feature? Well, it features a fund to need and a live auction. It's also going to be, you know, any event that you do is still going to be a mix of things that are happening live and things that are happening pre-recorded. But there are a lot of ways to do pre-recorded content that's really engaging, like the video that you just saw, or even, you know, game show segments or interviews or things like that. Like having it um, filmed where they're live to tape so that it still feels like it's part of the live show. And then you know, I have a theater background. I love spectacle. Like, I love the theatrics of all of these, but you still need to have a very strong narrative arc about your events. Like, you need to tell your story about why the work you do is so important and what impact people can make or people can have by supporting you. So that narrative arc really needs to be a strong through line that's running from the time your very first invitation goes out all the way through to the end of the event. Also like to give your audience the ability to have a say in the outcome of the event. And, and what I mean by that is to have, an, to have an impact, not just in the auction or the fund to need. And, and the best way to, for me to describe this is by a, a long-winded anecdote and nobody on this that knows me will find that surprising. So bear with me. My son's school this past spring, one of the first to ad, ad, make the adaptation and do a virtual event. And they had this one element of their show where they had three teachers who had agreed to this in advance and you could make pledges on behalf of any one of those teachers. And it was it, low level, $10 increments. So you could do $10, $50, 100, 500, 5,000, whatever you wanted to donate in the name of that teacher. And at the end of the show, whichever teacher had the most pledges in their name performed live karaoke on screen. And look, the, the point here isn't to say that, that everybody should go do karaoke because Beth will be the first to point out that, that the, the copyrights surrounding pre you know, other people's music are, are you know, can Tricky. shut your whole show down. Um, but the point is to say that it gave people watching the ability to vote with their wallets, right? And so to take that idea and run with it and do something that, that works for you. There are a lot of great options. Uh, a friend and fellow fundraising auctioneer in LA took this idea and ran with it for an animal rights organization that he works with. And they had a race between three of the animals and you could make a pledge on in behalf of one of the animals, right? You know, the hedgehog or, or you know, whatever. And at the, at, the, at the end of the race, whichever animal won, everybody who had made pledges on that animal's behalf was entered into a drawing for a rare magnum of wine. I'm doing a circus themed event in January. And if we raise $500,000 in the fund to need, the executive director is gonna get a pie in her face on screen. And she's totally on board. She said, you know what? Every $100,000 above that can be another pie, right? The goal is to give your audience the ability to have a say in the outcome of the, of the event and to be able to make their voices heard with their wallets. Finally, our dream virtual gala would include an ongoing ask. The, as Beth calls it, the forward to a friend phenomenon so that, that after the show, you can forward the link to friends and family and they can go look and, and get captured by your content and decide that they still want to support you and have the opportunity to do so. So how do you make your virtual gala a dream? Uh, well, we're going to start with uh, a component uh, that a lot of people have, not all people have, but we'll start with our silent auction. So silent auctions have been performing very well this year. Um, more people are shopping online than ever before because we can't go out to actual stores. Um, I saw a stat somewhere that said that in the third quarter of 2020, online shopping was up 37% over last year. And browsing in a silent auction is basically shopping online. 
So what do people like to shop for online? Well, we know that wine, dining, and trips remain popular, um, but this year we've seen more generalized shopping doing well. There's been a surprising uptick in performance for goods and services. These are not the types of things I typically recommend for auctions, but this year it's working. So your retail goods like TVs and tablets, if you have a PS5 right now and can put in an auction, that's a super hot you know, item. Jewelry has been holding well, has been holding up really well in silent auctions when usually it's pretty subjective. And then all of the services, interior design and home makeovers and, you know, landscaping, like we're all spending a lot more time at home looking around at our houses and thinking like, oh, I would actually like to put a fire pit in the backyard. So that kind of thing is doing much better now than it has in the past in a silent auction. And your silent auction, it also, you know, can fulfill other purposes. So in addition to your invitations and your save the date, silent auction a lot of times for people is like the first marketing touch for your virtual gala in the week before your event. So I like to open the silent auction early and run it for anywhere from three to seven days. It's going to ensure that people have uh, gone to your auction website, gotten their credit card registered, started looking at your, you know, whatever you have up on your bidding platform. It's going to be getting people looking at your auction lots. Um, again, run it anywhere from three to seven days. So I typically close the silent auction after the live stream, either noon the next day or early evening. Um, Greg mentioned the forward to a friend phenomenon. I like to get to the end of the event and say, you know, this was great. Like, thank you so much. Or don't forget, like, there's 24 more hours to bid in the silent auction or make a donation on the funded need. You know, go ahead and share that link with your friends if there's someone that you think would be interested. And, and we're seeing a, an uptick in, in post-event donations and and also people do keep bidding. Like the thing about bidding in auctions is that savvy bidders are going to wait to the end to bid whenever that ending is. So go ahead and let it extend, you know, 24 more hours. Um, I want to touch quickly just on uh, bid increments because I think people have questions about this a lot or they should have questions. I like to start my silent auction bid increments at at least 50% of value. A lot of folks are starting them lower. Um, silent auction shoppers tend to be more bargain shoppers. So I don't like to enable that. I like to start those bid, the minimum bid a little bit higher and then move in bid increments of around 10% um, of the value. And then you just kind of want to round up so that your value is made. So that all the numbers, so it's like drunk math, right? Like all the math makes sense. So if you have a $300 item, you're going to want to open it at around $150 and move in like a $25 bid increment. $500 value, open it to 50, bid increments of $50, et cetera. And then how many items should you have? This is a question that comes up a lot for in-person events, but as even more so, I think, for virtual events. And, you know, really the, the thought here is that you don't want the number of items in your silent auction to outnumber the number of bidders that you would have bidding. You want to create a, a smaller list of items will create a sense of scarcity and that's going to actually increase the bidding on each individual item. So you really want to focus on quality and not quantity. So if you only have 10 silent auction items, but they're all great, like that's fine. Like just have your 10 silent auction items. If you are trying to put together an auction that has more than a hundred items, like they need to either be exceptional or you need to have a really big crowd of bidders. If you're going to have a hundred auction items, I would expect you to have, you know, 400 bidders that are actively bidding. So you've got a four to one ratio. So um, we will get to the live auction. I know Greg's got some, some showcase lots of things that worked really well this year, but we wanted to take this in the order that things typically happen in a virtual gala, which is different than you would do in an in-person event. So instead of going live auction next, we are going to talk about the fund need. It was a it was a bait and switch. We said live auction was going to be yeah. next in the outline, and then we aha we sprung the fund the need on you because you heard that right. We advocate doing your fund the need before the live auction, typically in the first third of your show. And look, we're not in a mad rush. We got to get to the fund the need. Oh my god! But what we want to do is create a narrative arc that builds to giving, right? We want to emphasize your message. We want to engage your crowd emotionally and build to the fund of needs so that when we make the ask, we have as many of your attendees' attention as possible. And I encourage you to embrace the unique aspects of virtual, right? If you're using a bidding platform and we hire, highly encourage you to do so, this is going to mean that a lot has changed about the ways in which people engage with your fund of need. The, ver the fund and need virtually is no longer a single moment when we work our way through the increments. Who's going to pledge 10,000? Who's going to be 5,000? Because 
as soon as you open your fund to need, people can begin making pledges at any level simultaneously. So you could have somebody donating 5,000 at the same time Bob Smith's doing 50 bucks, right? And you could fight this, but really it would be at the cost of hamstringing your fundraising efforts. So we encourage you to embrace it. Open your fund to need early like six hours to a day early, sometimes with the silent auction early. Get some pledges in there so that we can have some momentum before we even start broadcasting, right? It's gonna give you momentum. It's gonna capture pledges from people who might not be able to attend the event, but still wanna give you money. And it's gonna give your auctioneer material for on show. If you look at that list of donors on the right, can you tell which ones made pledges before the show started and which one made pledges during the show? Me either, right? But I, I know from having done this event that Sharon West was our first giver. And so after the video, uh, you know, after what, right when we get to the point where we're starting to take the pledges, we can react to all of these pledges as if they just happened and give everybody their appreciation and their acknowledgement and make it feel like that sense of urgency that we're striving for. Sharon West pledged $5,000. Gail Thorne's in for $100. Thank you, Gail. We appreciate every pledge. Every pledge makes a difference. Jay Agalado in for five, you know, and go on. On like that. One huge difference is that you don't have to ride that momentum all at once. Open the show with a reminder of where to make a pledge and how to register if people haven't already. It's great to see everybody tonight. Just a reminder that you can go to our bidding platform, go to event2020.ggo.bid or whatever bidding platform you use, get registered and be prepared because we've got plenty of opportunities and the way that you are involved is by participating through our bidding platform. Then later in the show, introduce the concept of giving. Talk about the pledge amounts. If you look on our bidding platform, you're gonna be able to see that you can make pledge amounts at all sorts of levels. Get those numbers in people's heads before you start doing the really emotionally engaging videos or testimonials. And then usually there's gonna be one main moment where there's a lot of momentum and people are making a lot of pledges and, and people start jumping in and, and we start to hit all the, all the pledges at once. But really there can be multiple moments of reacting to the pledging throughout the show. Your crowd is engaging with your fund and need in a different way. If you have hundreds of viewers, they could be engaging with your fund and need in hundreds of different ways all at once. And most bidding software makes it easy for your intrepid auctioneer to see who has made pledges and ensure that no pledge goes unrecognized. In fact, we've really found that interrupting the flow works, right? Have your auctioneer call out names and amounts and then transition to stories of what the money does and where it goes. Have it be a visual transition as well so that it's not just a transition in tone and tempo, but it's a transition in what people are seeing on screen, right? Then or transition to stories of the work that you do, or in, in drastic cases, transition to three to four minute videos of what you do, then back to pledges and repeat as possible. In a recent fund to need, we transitioned from calling names and dollar amounts to short segments of the charity's mission four times. And on paper, it looked like it was gonna be too much, but in our first rehearsal, realized that it was brilliant. And now I recommend it as a best practice. We also recommend coming back to the fund of need at the end of the program to check in on any pledges that have come in and to encourage people to forward the link to their friends and family who couldn't join the event live that evening. Once again, the forward to a friend phenomenon. And, and we said, look, we appreciate every pledge. Those of you who couldn't be with us today, but are watching and recording the stream, just know that you can make a difference. Your pledges right now can go to continue to help this great work. And we appreciate you, even if we're not acknowledging you on screen right now. Uh, let's see, where are we? Keep your fund and need open after the show, right? I, I know we've said this before, but usually a week, right? Sometimes a day, but, but oftentimes as much as a week because uh, one fund and need actually that we did is still open. It's going to be open until the end of the year. Events often get a decent amount of pledges after the event. We've seen an event get a 25% increase in seven days. Another event received an additional $110,000 in their, their fund to need after the event, which, which wasn't 25%, but it was a wonderful success. And next level fund to needs represent their ask with a combination of pre-recorded videos, testimonial, and still images. And look, it's supposed to be a TV show, so approach it as such. Get as much video as you can showing what you do and for whom you do it. Emphasize what the money is gonna help you do. Tie pledge amounts to real results. A hundred, you know, a thousand dollars will help us do what? And then utilize a public goal if it's gonna motivate your crowd. I'm not being sarcastic when I say, should you use a goal? Well, can you hit it? 
Will the goal be a motivating factor for your crowd? Because if you think you can hit it, then sure. One of the nice things about a bidding platform like Greater Giving is the fact that you can have a thermometer that fills up as people make pledges, but doesn't have a goal stated outright. It just shows money coming in and money going up, but it doesn't say whether you've hit the goal or not. Personally, I love a goal. I love challenging a crowd to rise to the occasion. And if we're concerned that, that we could exceed the goal, then we always have a backup plan in terms of being able to communicate that the need that we stated, we, you know, we were trying to be cautious because this is our first or second virtual event, uh, but you've done great work and the need still exists, right? At its core, the fund and need has not changed. It is still about motivating your crowd to support your great work and celebrating your crowd's support in real time and utilizing all of that to create a sense of momentum and urgency and leave people with a sense of accomplishment that emotionally resonates after the event. That brings us to our final fundraising act of most virtual gala. It's the live auction. And the big question, whether virtual or in person, is always, well, what type of auction item should we sell? And if you weren't on our webinar yesterday, we did an overview of live auction lots. You can find that webinar at stellarsf.com slash webinars. It's already up there. And, and I'll be focused on a few creative lot ideas we've seen, but I'm really going to be more focused on the production aspect of a live auction. But a brief recap, given where we're going to be with the pandemic in the spring, you're going to have the rare opportunity to sell two types of lots and have them sell well. Lots that can be utilized immediately and lots for when things return to normal. And we envision seeing a return to normal both in our daily lives and our live auctions in 2021. So restaurants and dining and food related entertainment, they remain our biggest sellers. Trips, you know, local COVID safe for now, big trips for later. Sports are gonna make a big comeback in fundraising auctions in 2021. And as Beth mentioned earlier, goods and services did surprisingly well in 2020. So I think it's worth taking a shot at them in your virtual gala in 2021, but don't bank your entire virtual gala on it. But I wanna talk about some specific lot ideas that maximize the virtual environment and are very rooted in our current reality. Instant gratification. Anyone who has worked with me over the years knows I love the instant gratification lots where you have a low retail value, but hopefully a high perceptual value. Like the bottle of champagne served to the winning bidder's table as the opening lot, or a better dessert served to the winning bidder's table. Right now though, it's hard to get something delivered to a winning bidder during a show. We, we actually tried this once and, and it got there, but no one could see that it had arrived, right? Other than the winning bidder, which kind of defeated the purpose, right? It didn't generate any additional energy for the show or additional bidding or anything. So we modified it. So for a Saturday night event, we had a bottle of champagne. Actually, it was two bottles of champagne. The bidding started on Monday for, this, for these two bottles of champagne, ended on Wednesday, the week leading up to the show, to be delivered to the winning bidder on Thursday. And the caveat was not just that they were getting champagne, but they were buying their way into the show. They had to immediately open one bottle and film themselves toasting the, I mean, you know, get, get, get gussied up so you look good on camera, not like the door opens, but they had to very quickly open one bottle and film themselves toasting the organization. Got us the video. This is her and her sister toasting Chanticleer. And, and we used it as the opening lot for the show, as the opener for the show. The lot had already sold, but we used the video. So we managed to do some pre-marketing, get some bidders in and registered, generate a little bit of momentum and create an opener for the show that tied in. It was fun. We often recommend a year of dining as an auction item where you take, you know, eight to 12 restaurant gift certificates, combine them into a single lot. It's still popular, but this year restaurants might not be able to donate. And if there's one thing, one of the lessons we've learned from the wildfires in Northern California over the last four years is that everybody gets hit by a crisis in different ways. And some or some businesses still want to participate and can, and others want to, but can't. So we always encourage reaching out and starting by acknowledging a challenging situation. We know you've been hit hard this year from a bunch of different directions. We've appreciated your support over the years. Your donation has always done well in our auction. We would love it if you can participate again this year, but there's you know no pressure if you can't. We're happy to give you time and come back when you're good and ready. And one final option is 
if they can't make a donation, have an underwriter sponsor the package, right? Somebody you can be prepared to spend $100 or more at each restaurant that, that isn't capable of donating and is in a position to be able to do, get, do so. And to update it for 2020, what we've actually done is we've had great success by expanding it beyond restaurants. So we go for restaurants and other small local businesses, bookstores, hardware stores, bakeries, you know, on and on and on. And, and the goal is that you create a year of shopping local, makes for a great story to be told. You know, you can say that uh, you know, the, a generous underwriter put this together for us so you can support your local businesses and us at the same same time does good in your community beyond your event generates some goodwill with those organizations uh, with those businesses but also really just does some good good in your community and creates a fun auction lot that hopefully sells for a bunch keep calm and COVID on this is for the crowd that likes to have fun with a given situation I'm not sure how long this lot's going to be relevant but you know this we sold this just a couple of weeks ago this literal lot the picture you see hand sanitizer wet wipes huge pack of toilet paper um, some keep calm lots have had an iPad with a subscription to Netflix bottles of booze wine both everything you need to shelter in place F 2020 this auction lot sums up many people's attitudes toward this year, right? F 2020. And basically when we can return to life as normal, what is the biggest way that you are going to tell 2020 to F off? And, and really you need to find your crowd's truth in this. And if this isn't right for your event, Hey, it's not right for your event, but if your crowd's the type that's going to respond to it, then figure out what your truth is, right? For some, it's going to be a trip to New York or a big gathering of people, a party, if you will, however you do it, right? We're just taking, we're creating a story, a narrative about moving beyond our current situation and supporting you. Could be an existing lot you normally have, just rebranded with possibly some slightly different aspects to it. One of the big questions we always get is, how many lots should we have in our live auction or virtual gala? And in your virtual gala, I can say that you can do as few as one. My record this year for, for a virtual gala is 30. I did 30, of, 30 lots. Uh, individually, right? The real question is how long do you want your auction to be in? And, and, and how long is your show? How much time do you have for your auction? So you have to complete your run of show and that'll leave you with a chunk of time that tells you exactly how much time you have to do your live auction. So for the sake of this conversation, let's say that you have a very program heavy virtual gala that only leaves you with 15 minutes for your live auction. Well, then you have to make a choice of how you want to sell your auction items, individually or in groups. And individually takes me about three minutes per lot to pitch and sell an auction item. Uh, I just did a 20 lot wine auction. It was a virtual gala. We sold them individually. The entire gala beginning to end lasted 68 minutes. Every pre recorded video, the video for the fund to need, the fund to need, and 20 wine lots. 68 minutes, start to finish. It was pretty good, pretty close to on time. But let's get back to our example and say you have 15 minutes with which to work. If you're going to sell your lots individually, then we know that we can do some third grade math, five items in 15 minutes. But virtual options, virtual offers other options because you can sell lots in groups. This means you're not bunching things together and you're, what you're doing is you're having things close at the same time. So lot number one, lot number two, and lot number three are all going to be in a group that closes at the same time. Your bidders are bidding individually on each lot, but they're all closing at the same time. It takes me three minutes to sell one lot alone, but it only takes me three minutes plus one minute for each additional lot. So two lots in a group or four minutes, three lots in a group or five and so on. So if we wanted to do three groups of three, then we could have nine lots sell in 15 minutes as a group, as opposed to five lots individually. One of the things that we utilize in virtual galas is a countdown timer. And sometimes we use it. And if you're selling groups, if you're selling your items in groups, then we highly recommend a countdown timer. Although one minute, two minutes is way too much time, more like 20 to 30 seconds max. But this lets everyone know when the bidding is going to end on all lots in a group. And so it doesn't make your auctioneer, doesn't put your auctioneer in the position of having to bounce back and forth and say, okay, is there any bidding on anyone? Like just say, okay, here we go. Seems like the bidding is slowed down on all three. We've got 30 seconds left. Here we go. Um, if you're selling lots individually, then you need to ask your AV company what the latency is going to be for your event. Latency is the time it takes from when your presenter says something to then when it gets to your people at home. 
and I've had latency as high as 45 seconds this year. And the latency is not with the bidding platform. We need to, can't say this enough. When people bid, whether it's Greater Giving or GiveSmart or ClickBid or any one of the bidding platforms, when people bid, the bids are registered and shot back to you in less than a second. The, the, the latency is with the streaming platforms. YouTube is pretty fast. Uh, I've done shows at the Lux where they consistently for the last few months have it down to seven or eight seconds latency, which is fantastic. Vimeo is slow. Vimeo is where I had the 45 second latency. So if you have low latency, hey, it's your choice. You want to do a countdown timer, real-time close, whatever is comfortable for you and your auctioneer. But if you have a high latency, like it's really going to be a big delay, then we recommend that you use a countdown timer so that you can establish a truth that holds true for everyone. And needless to say, whoever is closing your auction items, whoever your auction administrator is, they need to be watching your stream from an attendee standpoint so that they are subject to the latency so that when your auctioneer says fair warning and sold, they are eight seconds later, they hear it and close it because you don't want them to be in the same room, closing it immediately and then having bidders go, wait, it's supposed to still be open. Open your auction items early, anywhere from six to 24 hours before the show goes live. This gets people invested in the bidding. It builds some momentum. It gives your auctioneer action to react to. It's like calling a horse race that is partly run, but making it feel like real time. And I did one event where we opened the bidding as soon as the show started, and we had 80 something percent of our bids on each auction item before we even got to calling them. And people are like, don't you think that sucks? I'm like, no, we got a bunch of bids. The goal is to get bids and to make the people bidding feel like we acknowledge and acknowledge them, appreciate them and create a sense of momentum. At the end of the day, the show is about raising money for organizations, not proving that we're able to do an auction in a specific way. That brings us to our final thing. Okay, so you're gonna do a virtual gala. How much time do you have? Uh, yeah, and that's a, that's a question I get a lot about how much time you should spend planning your gala. And, you know, we all know that if you have an annual gala, it never really goes away. Like you may take a break for a few weeks after you've had your event, but most organizations are getting event chairs and key vendors in place 10 to 11 months in advance. So the planning process for a virtual gala does look a little bit different because you take a lot of focus off of table decor and rental orders and print deadlines, and your focus is much more on video production. Um, the bulk of the work, I would say, is going to be done around 90 days in advance, although hopefully you have booked your AV company far in advance of that, because you should give yourself more time than 90 days to plan an event. Um, I think the big things that you wanna start at with the beginning is determining your format and your price structure. Um, you also are going to, um, you know, is it going to be a paid attendance? Will it be free to attend? That affects what your registration process is going to be, how you need to get that built out. Um, you may be doing sponsor benefits and you need to create those sponsor benefits. Um, you may also need to consider the timing of the year if you're doing sponsor benefits. Are you needing to get asks out? You know, if you're doing a spring event and you have sponsors, I hope those asks are already out before the end of this calendar year because that's when people are making budgeting decisions. So that needs to get factored in a little bit. Um, any kind of like auction or sponsors are going to make you need more lead time for your event. Um, another thing that you need to is going to affect the timeline is how much video production is required. This is one of the biggest tasks related to a virtual gala. Because previously, maybe you'd have your one video that goes right before the fund to need and everything else is handled live by someone speaking on the stage. But now, not only do you have your appeal video, but you may also be pre-recording opening remarks from your event chair or your board chair or the executive director. You may be getting uh, testimonial videos from like alumni or other program participants. So you need to give yourself plenty of time to conceptualize what you want that end product to be and then go out and execute that concept. So give yourself time to outline and create storyboards, hire a videographer if you're not doing them in-house, schedule all your video shoots, give yourself editing time. Um, your AV company is gonna want all of your completed videos in about 10 days before your event. So you really need to sort of back out from there. So my ideal timeline to plan a virtual gala, you know, is in the six month range, although longer works too. Um, 90 days, very doable. I have some sort of standard templates built for like a 60 and 90 day timelines. 
Um, it's December and I already have May events on the books that we've been working on, but I also, someone just reached out to me about an event that's happening on February 6th in Oklahoma. So, you know, um, 45 days or less is a challenge, but it's doable. Like ideally you're not planning a gala in less than 45 days, but you know, it, I've, I've done it in less. Um, factors to consider when you're looking at your timeline are just what elements do you want to include? Again, sponsors and auction items require more lead time. How much video production is required? What is your staff bandwidth to take on all of this, this work? And then again, just kind of time of year. You know, the biggest thing that scares me about this February event that someone just reached out to me about is that we're about to lose two weeks because of the holidays. So, you know, the time of year can really um, have an effect on how much time you need to give yourself to plan the event. And with that, I think we have some short final thoughts before we open up to our Q&A. Yeah, it's just some final thoughts, right? A well-executed virtual gala, gala will impress and engage your crowd, raise money, and make them want to do it again. Just had a wrap-up meeting with a Silicon Valley client that Beth and I worked on whose crowd was blown away by their virtual gala. And this is, you know, these are a bunch of people who spend a lot of time in virtual environments on a daily basis and have high expectations for what the entertainment value of what they're participating is going to be. And they were like, wow, that was awesome. You guys set the bar, right? You can do it. You just need to be creative. Think of it as a show more than a gala and, and, and get to it. And, and with that, let's get to some uh, Q&A. We're going to start the video so you can see us. Hey, hey. And um, you see our contact information there. If you want to reach me, I'm at StellarSF.com. You want to reach Beth, she's at BethSandifer.com. And uh, that information, as I said, this video will be made available after it'll be, you'll get sent the link tomorrow. Yeah, sorry, trying to do two things at once. And I'm obviously, I've had a little too much of that this year. We've got some questions coming in. Uh, yeah, let's, I want to jump to some of the ones that are in the chat though first. Oh, so, cool. Oh, there's a bunch yeah. in chat. Look at this. Oh, there's, Look at a few, there's a few in here. Um, so Scott Ants asked, uh, during the special appeal, are you concerned that supporters who donate early might have given more if they waited until the live event? Uh, that's a good question. And uh, no. I mean, I think that the short answer is no. Um, I, could, I could give a long-winded answer because I'm me. I think that to me, I feel like what I see is people that are giving in advance, it's either they know they're not able to tune in, right? It's so like, well, I'm just make my gift or they like have their set amount. Like I can give $50 or $100 or whatever, you know, or um, I mean, we've definitely had some like board members, they want to pre-populate and get it in there. But, you know, I've actually seen donors do a gift in advance and then get so caught up in the moment that they make a second gift during the appeal. And it's, I mean, it's so easy to just like tap out another donation that I, I don't feel like it's, it's a barrier. No, and I, 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 that reminds me of something that I think is relevant but ancillary, which is if you have people who can make donations, like like do $5,000 gifts or, or whatever, and they, they're making this commitment in advance, you also don't have to have them put it in the bidding platform in advance. You can hold those gifts and use the, utilize them the night of as ways of building momentum, um, which is a best practice that I should have included in all those other best practices. <laughs> Um, okay, I know there's some stuff in q and I just want to, Terry Let's had a question. Jump. At live events, successful auction items are experiential with no in-person, what are the best offers? And I think, I know you covered some stuff, but I think the general message that we say is that, like, do the auction that you would have done, right? Like, things haven't actually changed radically that much in terms of what works well. Yeah. Um, I see a couple more questions in chat, but I want to talk about, uh, yeah. David, I see you and I totally feel everything you're talking about. David asking questions in, in the Q and A is with Manhattan beach wine and auction, Man Manhattan wine auction, Manhattan beach education foundation. Their event is normally 2000 people on six tennis courts with 70 vintners, 50 chefs, and a ton of logistics. They did their virtual gala in May of this year. It was wildly successful. We raised four times what we would have in the fun to need in person. Um, and the the question is, if you if you did a virtual gala in 2020 and it was wildly successful, you got to do it again. What are your thoughts on how to make it better, differentiate it from 2020 so that people are willing to, still willing to take part? It's a great question. Beth's got an answer ready to go. You can tell. Um, I, yeah, I think you just have to make it look different. So for example, I have an event um, 
it was a San Mateo County event that did, we did an event with them in April and it was much like yours, David, it was a fully virtual event. So we had, you know, our heads on screen and our auction and all of that. And for their events that we are planning in March, we are still, it's still going to be a virtual, I mean, it's still going to be a virtual event. So people will be tuning in at home, but we're actually going to do a drive-in um, at a location in San Mateo County. So we'll have a giant screen on a field and there will be a ticket purchase where you're able to like drive your car to the event and watch like get your gourmet picnic box like delivered to you at your car. And so we'll have people watching there on site and people watching at home. So still a virtual event, but like completely different from the virtual event that they did before. So I think if you had, for example, a fully virtual event, do you go to more of a studio setup? And to answer your second question, because I see that in there too, like, yeah, I mean, an out an outdoor studio or like, we, we, we would call it like filming it on location. Like, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've actually already done some events, like uh, one of your auctioneers, Greg, did an event, right, at a, at a, I don't know what they are, they're a wilderness museum, <laughs> but they were like outside like right. at their museum location with animals yeah with animals yeah still had the ab company like running all the broadcasts but like we just went on location to the museum to to be able to feature you know their their location we did an event from a trailer this year everybody did. <laughs> which is a different story about internet connectivity failing you 45 minutes before the show that we'll talk about in some other other webinar but but it was fun um anonymous i have no idea where crowdcast falls in terms of latency haven't used it beth nope yeah sorry sure. sorry we don't have it um but david i think your 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 event sounds fun. Um, I saw in the chat, somebody asked, uh, guess no drinking for that event. Yeah, you're not going to drink. <laughs> Everybody could take Ubers and just pay them to sit there. Um, how do you maximize a matching gift? Uh, that's a good question. And as always, challenge grants, matching gifts are, are wonderful to have. They, pre they present interesting challenges. If you do not have a matching grant for your entire, I mean, the ideal is to have a matching grant for the entire fund to need. Every gift you make will be doubled, right? I mean, that's, that's a simple one. Normally, if we're in person and we don't have, if we have a gift that is generous, but not that generous, then we like to focus it on a specific level. And that's hard to do virtually. You still can. You need somebody savvy on the back end, like Beth, managing your bidding platform to be able to go in and say, hey, look, we have, you know, 15 gifts at a thousand. And so we're still 10,000 shy of that, of that $25,000 challenge grant at the thousand dollar level. Um, but we've had success in other ways this year. Well, and would you like expand on that, Greg? I was trying to throw that to that. I was lobbing yeah, that pitch well, to you. Well, sure. Yeah, no, I'll take that. I'll take that. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of different ways that we've approached it because, you know, as Greg mentioned, like people are going to be able to give at any amount at any time. So doing it, you know, a specific number of gifts at a specific level is difficult. Like I've done it, but I do not like it when people ask me to do that. So what we've had more success with is pitching it as like an overall match, but att attaching it to time somewhere. Either it we're starting right at the beginning and the first $50,000 that's given is gonna be matched and we do that, or we let the funding needs start going and say, oh, what's that? You know, you know, we have an anonymous donor and if we can raise, you know, an additional $25,000 in the next two minutes, like then that will be matched or do it as like a finish line goal, right? Like we're so close to our goal. We just need 50,000 more dollars to get there. We have a $25,000 match. So if you can raise 25, that 25 will be matched. It'll get us our 50 that gets us to our goal, like, and let's go. So I think there's kind of, depending on the size of the gift, like how much you've kind of got pre-committed, sort of all those things you can figure out, you know, where best to place it. And there have been times when, you know, we have gone into an auction and I don't know what Greg's going to do. Greg's going to do it when Greg feels like Greg should do it based on how the momentum of things is going because you are reacting in real time. I mean, I've had events where we were like, oh, I don't know, is it going to happen? And like people were giving so fast that it was like, oh, okay. You know, like you can, you know, the momentum, you can be caught by surprise. So if it's someone like Greg, you know, um, I, I, like I said, we've just kind of said, okay, well, we know we need to use it. Like you figure out when is the best place to put it based on how the giving is going. That get you, Scott? That take care of it? <laughs> no other questions. questions. Oh, I mean, and I said I was going to have like a pocket question. To right, and I was going to have a pocket question. And I'm not, you know. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I feel like the key, the key takeaway for me for 2020, honestly, has been just adaptation, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I have experienced my two worst nightmares in virtual gals this year. I had auction software crash on event day, and we had the internet go, go out 45 minutes before we were supposed to go live because of a heat wave and a Comcast outage and whatnot. And in Fires, cases, it was the fires. Well, yeah, or I think that one was a heat. Like, who knows? California. It was something was burning, or it was. Um, but we, you know, we we had to adapt and make it work. And in both cases, um, you know, the events were still the organizations were still able to raise a lot of money. So I think you just really need to like get out of your box and sort of think about like how do we come at the solution and you know treat this like a TV show and not like replicating your in person event online. Oh, and now we got questions. See, the questions coming still, in. So questions somebody asked ahead. what our vision is for hybrid. And that's such a good question that we're going to dedicate an entire webinar to it in the beginning of January. There, there is not enough time to, to really go into it now, other than to say, just like live events or in-person events, there's not going to be a one size fits all. Some events are going to do their event at Fort Mason with a thousand people, a big venue here in, in the Bay Area. Other events are going to do it in a church basement. And just like that with hybrid, some events are going to be smaller production shows where you're basically just sending home what everybody else is seeing. And others are going to have basically two shows. And that's, that's going to Yeah. Up. I mean, I will say that I think the biggest challenge around hybrid events is going to be what is the guest experience for people that are with you in person and what is the guest experience for the people that are at home and how do you have those like blend together seamlessly because it's not as simple as oh we'll have a hundred people in the room and we'll just set up a camera in the back and broadcast what's happening in the room to the people at home like you almost sort of end up with like two parallel productions which is why yeah it's just a whole bigger conversation when do you do specific fund the need levels and when do you not? Well, I mean, uh, it's a good question, Jerry. And I think that the, the reality is, is that when you're using a bidding platform, um, you, you say that there are levels that are available. You can pledge 5,000 or 2,500 or 1,000 or 500 or 250, but hey, you know what? You don't see a level that you like, enter a custom amount, right? You want to bid $11,000? We love you. You think 2021 is going to be a better year, bid $2,021. But the reality is, is that while people are doing, while people are making pledges, they can make them at any level, right? And, and I think that it's nice to enable that and to not fight it. You can say we're taking pledges at these levels and work your way through it. And, and there's a lot of workarounds on the back end to create it, so, to make it so that your auctioneer is only seeing the pledges that are made at a specific level at a specific time with most of these bidding platforms. And I don't think they're worth it. So when do you do specific fund the need levels? When you're back in person. Mm-hmm. Have we had success with watch parties during an auction? Yes, Mary, good to see you. Hope the weather's good in Kansas City. Your cursed chiefs are doing so well this year. Um, your, Mahomes is the man. He's fun to watch. Um, yes, we've had success with watch parties during an auction. Um, and and as, as we said during the presentation, I think it's really beneficial to try and find a way to bring a couple of those watch parties into the show so that we can make the event, the, the broadcast, more about everybody watching and not just think but yes we've had we've had success with watch parties i think one of the challenges we learned with watch parties this year was not to encourage people to have watch parties at a restaurant uh because they got really distracted and there wasn't a proper AV in place for them to be able to watch the show and eat and participate. And so we kept getting feedback saying, oh, we, we missed the close on that. I'm like, well, you know, we stated it out, right? We were very, oh yeah, but we were having such a good time. So, I mean, I think the watch parties need to be set up, encouraged to be set up in such a way that it's about watching the show and having a party, not having a party with the show in the background. Mm-hmm. Uh, question, how many organizations want the auctioneer to have their own studio rather than spending money on an AV studio? So I, so this is an interesting question. I feel like what you're needing to spend money on, it's less about the studio and more about who is providing the broadcast software and all the streaming and switching services. It is impossible for an auctioneer to be conducting an auction and also be actually running the show. So like they, like from a technical standpoint, like they would need a team of people to do it. So, you know, 
you're not going to bake that in. I mean, I, I know there's a lot of auctioneers on this call and I want to like speak for everybody, but I don't know of any auctioneer that has that just like baked into their fee. It would be like, here's my fee for auctioneering. And like, here's the fee for, you know, the AV part. I know from my end, from a planning perspective, I have had a lot of clients come to me and say, like, can you, like, can you provide the AV? And it's like, sure, I can. I have a partner company that I work with. They do it and I just subcontract them. So all you're doing is you're hiring me and I am bringing every Thing that you need you know so like there's just a lot of back-end stuff that you don't see because I'm just bringing it to you but there's still a fee associated because you know you have to have labor that's handling all the switching and sending things out and there's subscription services for the software and you know I mean the partner company that I work with we actually send our internet we send our broadcast out on two simultaneous internet streams so that if one goes down like there's a second one in place and there's there's costs associated for the you know the, the, the computers and the logistics involved in being able to do that. So yeah, I don't know if that's kind of an all over answer to a question. But. And I think it, it really comes down, I mean, what I think it comes down to is basically a uh, sort of a choice at the very beginning, right? So if, if somebody's deciding to do their event on a self-hosted platform like Zoom or some of the other uh, self-hosted platforms that are out there, then they're going to expect the auctioneer to have their own home studio set up. So, or there are many events where I've done 100% remote production, right? So what you're looking at is where I've raised millions of dollars this year from my home studio. Um, thanks to all my AV partners who helped set me up with the stuff you see behind me. Um, but uh, I think when it comes to the responsibility and the liability of being the person who is handling the production, the switching, the sh changing between videos and all that sort of stuff, I don't want it. I don't have it in my contract. It's not a liability or responsibility I want to have. I want to be the talent and offer best practices on consultation on how to do an event, but there is no way, shape or form. I want to be the person who's, and I know they've got a buddy in LA who set up a studio in his thing and, and, and he's like ready to take this and roll with it and then more power to him. But personally, like I would much rather partner with people who are going to, you know, if we're going to do a Zoom event, I'm still not going to be the person who's doing the switching and any of that. So, I mean, I think it's important as an auctioneer to have a setup that is broadcast quality, but not to put yourself in the position where you are responsible for the broadcast. Because as soon as something happens and your internet goes down and, and you can no longer make the switching, then you're liable for whatever doesn't get raised that day, unless you've got a really good contract in place. When you have a remote at a watch party, how long do you typically stream from the remote location? Oh, you, Scott, you keep it short, right? I mean, you keep it short and you keep it scripted and you make sure that the interactions that you're having with people uh, like you've rehearsed and played with, like what you don't want to do is spend a whole bunch of time dragging on and on and on, but you want to make it so like, hey, and now we're going to go to the Kinsky Stern family and hey, it's so good to see you guys. And everybody goes crazy and like, oh, have you picked out which auction lots you're going to bid on? And they say, oh yeah, we're interested in this and that. And what wine are you drinking? Oh, great sponsors, wine, blah, blah, blah and then you move on, right? And Mary, no worries. Uh, we appreciate all the questions. We appreciate you being here. Um, we're over the hour. Uh, I am an auctioneer. I will talk as long as you let me. And Beth loves chatting about this stuff. And this is our last virtual event of the year. So we're happy to keep going. So we don't feel like we're glad. Let's see, still 32 people with us. Wow. I'm a little like, hmm. Um, thanks for, for being here with us. Uh, we totally appreciate all of you for joining us. Don't feel like we're happy to keep going if you have questions uh, and we're happy to keep talking. But we also, you know, Take this a is moment. Greg filling for time to see if there's any more. <laughs> if there's, if there's one, out. see, Terry, if there's one thing I've gotten good at this year, it is just talking endlessly, looking at a camera and trying to check all of the different social media or media inputs around me to see if there's anything else coming in. My mantra this year, and, and we joke about this, but my mantra this year has become uh, keep those pledges coming. Every pledge makes a difference, right? You know, and I just, I, I love auctioneer, love to, but keep those, keep those questions coming. Every question and helps us expound, expound more knowledge. So keep the, I got the eye roll. I got the eye roll. I can, I can call it a day. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, I hey, Michael. Yeah. Good to see you. 
Good to see everybody. We're glad you're here. So look, hey, happy holidays. Stay safe, stay sane. We are going to come back in the beginning of the year and start talking about hybrid and everything else once we get a feel for when that's going to be. And trust me, as soon as we started doing this, Beth and I started thinking about like, well, what does it look like when we can be back in the room together? And so we have lots of thoughts about it, but we wanted to focus right now on virtual because that's where we're going to be for the next four to six months at the very least. I so mean six. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, the eternal optimist. Trust me, we are all anxious to get back to in-person events. I just think that hybrid, I really think hybrid events are going to have, again, just sort of challenging programmatically. And just, I'm, I think they're going to be a lot more expensive than people think that they're going to be because you're basically going to have to produce an in-person event and a virtual event on top of it. So yep. it's not going to be like a 2x cost, but it's going to be like 1.7. One, well, no, not even like 1.3, 1.4, like somewhere in there. So I think that when I've had conversations with people already, it's like you start talking about all the things that go into them and I start seeing people glaze over and I'm like, or you could just stay virtual. Just be virtual for now. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. But okay. whatever you do, stay safe. Thanks, Connie. Give my best to, to your lovely and then just, you know, next time bring some of those lovely treats that you guys cook because they, they always look so delicious. Um, and the, I know we've seen some, some chat that said the video is not up on, on our website. Yes, it's on YouTube. I'll get it over on our website and I will get this up on YouTube and you will all be sent the link tomorrow. And um, that's it, everybody. Stay safe, stay sane. Happy Hanukkah, happy holidays and happy new year. And, you know, just keep on adapting. Keep on adapting.